Okay, let's open it up for questions. Uh, Nadim and the yeah. Yeah, we're going to try to have the buy side uh, regain the questions here. Uh, two questions. One, what amount of debt to EBITDA and or credit rating you would be comfortable going to? I, I, you know, at a at a situation where there's a large acquisition or a large share repurchase. So, so how high up on the debt and how low down on the credit rating? And and separately, sort of related to that, what do you think a business like Nestle should be generating in terms of return on capital? Uh, I saw the obviously the improvement in the last few years, which is impressive. But what would you think should be a reasonable ROIC target that we should be expecting from that business? Thank you. Maybe I'll start with the uh, item on the net debt to EBITDA. So we said in, uh, two years ago that we expected to have as a consequence, not a guidance, as a consequence of our action and mainly our share buyback, that we expected to learn around 1.5 times in terms of net debt to EBITDA ratio, which has been increased to 1.7 as a consequence of the reclassification of some debt items for IFRS 15 and 17. Sorry for the technicality. Uh, so we were at 1.6 last year. We should be around 1.6 at the end of this year as well. Uh, we don't provide any guidance there huh, in terms of uh, net debt to EBITDA ratio. As far as rating is concerned, so as I said earlier, we are double A today, double A and double A minus. We have publicly said that uh, we would be comfortable if the opportunity was arising to be in the single A space as a floor. But only if the opportunity uh, rises. Huh? So it's not, uh, this is, there is no target there, there is no uh, ambition. You want to On the second question, look, we're not providing a target number, but it should be more than what you saw for last year. So the answer is more. Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, on the DSD, on the US DSD D exit, um, first, I know it's a relatively small number in the big scheme of things, but on a run rate basis, about how much TOP are we talking about, do you think, in savings after 2020, order of magnitude? How much savings from the move? Clearly, there's some savings. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, um, you know, I, your managers you mentioned, uh, I think, made a lot of really good points about how the route to market has changed and how distribution relevance has really declined relative to innovation. And I wonder if that process yielded any other insights of other places in your developed market businesses where there's an opportunity to maybe reduce, reallocate from distribution and maybe marketing into innovation or you know, some of the other things you've emphasized more today. Thank you. Thanks. So look, on that first question about the efficiencies and savings, we'd love to be helpful, but we wouldn't, you, we, we, we wouldn't be doing you a favor. Because the minute we talk about this, the minute we'll have a negotiation about you know, how to share these savings uh, with our retail partners. So we are if generating savings here, but this is a fairly elaborate negotiation about you know, how these are being shared. And hence, I think it's in everyone's interest uh, uh, that we keep this close to our chest. Um, and then going forward, of course, you know, country by country, we're looking for alternative and better routes to market. But let me also say that there's nothing near the kind of scale and the vastness of this particular decision. And I also want to just reiterate to everyone here, this is not only in terms of the absolute numbers, a pretty massive decision, this is also uh, a fairly significant execution challenge for the US leadership team. I'm very glad that they took this on. I think beyond what we talked about here for 2019, 2020, this will really precision uh, those businesses for better profitable growth and we'll be benefiting from this for a long time to come. Any other questions? David? Hi. Um, just in terms of the, the size of the business, you've seen some of your peers in FMCG looking to, to get smaller, split the business, seemingly to, to shorten the process again on making decisions as you try and get more agility and so forth. Do you think the business is still far too big and that those big decisions are, are still too slow going through the, the business. I guess related to that, in terms of disposals, the her to disposal, um, can you just talk about why that is you know, the, the most recent um, brand that you're going to, to jettison from the business? You know, what is it about that when you reviewed it that didn't tip the boxes that it needed to have to, to stay in the business? And then the third question, 
which I guess is, again, ticking the box in terms of questions. Um, the L'Oreal steak, um, just wonder whether you can touch on whether where you are with that. I mean, I mean, I guess in the context of the skin review, it, it seems like you know, all the focus today has been on uh, the food business, and this is a food entity much more than perhaps we talked or heard about a few years ago. So where does L'Oreal steak still sit in a business that, that no longer seems to be wanting to get into skin stroke cosmetics? Thank you. Thanks. So when it comes to the first question, look, I mean, of course, you're always trying to improve. But as I look around, as I look at where the rest of the industry stands, I feel really good about the times to market that we've been talking to you about today. And uh, don't just take my word for it. When you look at some of the things, some of the products we talked about today and when and how they're hitting the market now. So think about the plant-based burger and what we said about this. Or think about Greg and the CBD product that he talked about. And if you look at the timing of some other key competitors and where they stand and how these products compare, I think it really shows we're there, okay? And um, this was never about beating other people by a week or so. Um, it was simply about avoiding sometimes year-long gaps where you know other people were building up a sizable business on the back of a product innovation that we were just not following on. And um, I think that has been stopped. And in fact, in quite a few of these, we're leading now. And, uh, and so we feel really strong about that. Um, on Herta, look, um, clearly you've heard us stress the importance of plant-based alternatives. And uh, I think plant-based is one of these trends that is not only attractive mid-term and, and, and short-term, but also mid to long-term, because this is not about people converting to veganism or something. This is about people just having a more flexible diet over time and uh, putting some plant-based alternatives into their meal plans. And as that happens over time, you will have all the elements for long-term megatrend here, whether it's on meat products or on, uh, on dairy products. Um, and I think with Herta, uh, this is a business that, of course, had its core and its, 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 its brand essence in cold cut and, uh, and sandwich type uh, uh, meat products. And uh, you're talking about um, industry fundamentals that are much lower growth, that are also quite volatile because uh, you're talking a lot of dependency on commodity pricing. The business has done wonderfully well in its segment. So in its segment, it's actually one of the leaders in Europe, and its, it's, its financial performance is wonderful. So in its segment, it's very attractive. But the segment overall is not one that is either financially imperative to us or strategically getting us where we want to be from a nutrition, health, and wellness point of view. And hence, I think it does make sense. And when it comes, I mean, very often we face today questions about specific timing, for example, the DSD or the HERTO or so. Um, this is never just um, on the business and on the individual opportunity alone. It's also keeping in mind all the other things that are on the plate of management. So, you know, how do you slot things so that management has enough time and energy left over to focus on what really matters, and that is building the business for the long term. And of course, when you look at Herta, uh, this is going to be some um, carve out and deconsolidation burden, in particular to the French management team, to the German management team, to Belgium, and to some extent also to the UK. And so we just, you know, in all of these things, it's about what you want to do. And then since you can't do everything at the same time, you have to balance this with what else is on the agenda. And then you have to make choices. And this is what we've done. Um, and then last but not least on uh, L'Oreal, uh, look, uh, nothing new to say on this. Um, and. Um, Clearly, here again, uh, it's in everyone's interest that um, while we, of course, uh, pay a lot of attention to this investment, uh, that we stay uh, very discreet about what our future plans are. Next question, uh, Warren. Uh, hi, it's uh, Warren at Barclays. Um, so two questions for Mark. The first one, Mark, is we've heard a lot today about personalization of the portfolio, whether it's tails.com or what you're doing with Pure Life. But my question is, how do you take that more broadly across the portfolio, and how do you conquer the extra costs of the, of the last mile of doing it profitably? And then the second one, you've also said recently in the last conference call that big companies can make a big difference, and that's obviously um, a bit of a fight back against all the small company share gains of the last few years. You gave the example of monitoring your customers on palm oil using drones, but that's obviously one small example. Are there any bigger examples that you can give us today where you think Nestle, as a big company, can make a really material difference? 
Yeah, and to start with the second one, let me just clarify, we're monitoring our suppliers, not our customers, so just uh, in case anyone is worried. Uh, but um, it, yes, um, look, this is an example where we could deploy technology uh, for, I think, a greater good purpose. And it's one more example <coughs> of, you know, moving things at scale that maybe a small to mid-sized company cannot do. And, um, and you may have noticed in most of our presen presentations today, this whole notion of creating shared value and business as, as, business as a force for good really figured large. And um, I think it is very much in our mind. And um, this is a day and age where doing good and doing well, uh, very often the consumer goods industry go hand in hand because uh, I think most of the younger generation of consumers, millennials, they do not only care about uh, what they're buying, they also care about how this is being made. They care about the business practices and the values of the companies uh, that they buy from. And it's no longer just good enough to be respected for the quality of the attributes of your products, but also uh, you need to be liked about you know, the way you go about your business. And uh, so this is a big theme. And uh, a lot of this has to do with style, but a lot of this has also to do with substance. So in my opinion, uh, this whole notion of really making a dent when it comes to, for example, and, 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 and showing progress when it comes to improving on plastics waste or improving on the water consumption, improving on CO2 emissions, and uh, many of the other issues that we touched upon, and really having impact. I think sooner or later people ask this question. It's no, it, you know, just being innocent about it is no longer good enough. People will want to see results just like you want to see financial results. And um, I think we have the scale, we have the technologies to make it happen. If we move in this direction and take that uh, satellite monitoring as an example, I'm totally convinced that um, you know when we started in food and beverage, we were the first ones. There's been several people following us now. This is gonna be the de facto standard on how you track suppliers uh, in that particular space in uh, palm oil going forward. And so we have that power pretty often as a result of our scale, and hence, let's use it. On personalization, I'm a big believer in this, and I believe you know this is also one of these longer-term themes that we can pursue, and uh, this is not only limited to the pet space, this is, of course, also a big theme in many of our uh, uh, f food and beverage categories, and uh, so uh, we'll be playing this, we'll be using this, and in some cases, it's more about an assortment, but you can also take it on a science-based basis all the way to the true medical needs of a consumer, whether that's in Nestle Health Science, in Nestle Nutrition, or even in some of the uh, mainstream food categories. So we're putting a lot of investments in place to position ourselves well for this. I think we have a lot of good projects going on, uh, led, of course, by Stefan, but then in close collaboration uh, with the Nutrition SBU and TRE, uh, with Greg, and then also with some of our US-based uh, uh, innovation outposts here, and uh, also even our US uh, food brands are involved in this. So um, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. It's also a way to stay digitally closer to the consumer because in order to do personalization, uh, you need to get into direct touch with the consumer digitally. You need to have data and they need to give it to you, and in return for that, they get a personalized product. And um, so in, a, in this important effort not to get disintermediated, um, I think it's worthwhile to put that spending in place and, uh, and we're quite bullish about this opportunity. Now, this is, you will see occasional areas of progress. You will see, for example, the expansion of tails.com. You will see other things uh, happen there. But to me, this is a five, 10, 15 year theme where you know, brand after brand and category after category, you will see us uh, uh, try and improve on that. So it's not like a one or two year kind of race. Next question from Martin. Thank you, it's Martin Debu Jeffries. Uh, the question is about how the organizational structure evolves medium and long term. Uh, one observes in the industry a move away from regional structures towards more direct management of large markets from the center. You're quite unusual in your zonal structure that you still have macro regional layers. And I guess the question I have is what, and I guess it's for you, Mark, is what value do you feel it creates for you to have North America and Latin America managed within one zone? You know, what, what is the value of that? I, I note what you said about the matrix at the start and I completely get 
why there's value in having a creative tension between a global category and some sort of geographic construct. But my question is, is the geographic construct you've got too large, too unwieldy? Look, um, if you approach something from a complete greenfield point of view, you could always debate about, you know, should this country or that country be included in this zone or the other one? And uh, different companies may come to different conclusions. But we have something, of course, that has uh, some historic track record here. And aside from this whole matrix question, which I addressed this morning, um, I would also just like to confirm these zone management structures do deliver. Okay, so when it comes to these zone management structures, providing good counsel and guidance and value added to the country management teams that then do the work on the ground, this works. Okay, and you may have seen from the presentation, different zones here have come to different conclusions. So Marco, uh, with his particular Western European challenge and you know these large, immediately neighboring markets and some stronger need for uh, category-led uh, um, uh, harmonization. He has structured this inside his zone slightly differently from the solutions we have in zone AMS and zone AO, and that's fine. You know, I think an organization our, our size needs to have some of that internal organizational flexibility. This is also one of the reasons why when people ask me about uh, these uh, three uh, globally managed businesses, uh, Waters and Nespresso, and Nestle Health Science, you know, after the move of Nestle Nutrition into the zones, like what is going to be happening to them, to me it's absolutely no problem to have those managed globally. They, they, you know, there's no pressure here to go one size fits all. A company our size can handle that. I insist on each and every one of those to be really super efficient and tightly managed. But, you know, just a one size fits all, the efficiency gains from that, I think would quickly be outweighed and lost by um, you know, some of the, um, the nuance that you're missing by having an organizational structure that doesn't do the business full justice. So I think having some of that flexibility makes sense. Uh, we also reserve the right, you know, not that I have anything to announce, we reserve the right as we look towards the future, if in the future we need to make geographic adjustments to some of our zones, yeah, we would, uh, if needed, do that. We've done it in the past. But for now, it's important for me to point out these zone management structures do work, and given the sheer size, and since there's no real peer in the industry that has a size like this, you know, any one of these zones could be a very, very large stock quoted food and beverage company in its own right. Um, I think it's important to bundle uh, some of these, uh, these country managements that, that report into the zones. Alan? Yeah, just um, we've heard on a couple of occasions where you um, find yourself capacity constrained in pet food, in, in infant nutrition. Uh, I'm just interested to know the, the circumstances that, that allowed that to happen and perhaps what, what you've, going forward, what will prevent that, that happening again? Look, let me start by reiterating something that came up in one of the pregs, and let me also praise Laurent for just very openly acknowledging this situation. Uh, there was no need for him to say this. And, uh, you know, to be very open about the fact that, yes, in wet pet food, we had these capacity constraint issues. We've been doing something about this. And now, I think, going forward, we're well, we're well positioned to fulfill that demand. To me, there was very open acknowledgement about something that did go wrong, together with the resolve to do better, I think is an important part of improving the organization going forward. Stuff will continue to go wrong. Okay, we're trying hard not to do it, but you know, if this is a large business, stuff will continue to go wrong. It's all about addressing it quickly, acknowledging it openly, and then goddamn it, do something about it. And that whole attitude, I think, you know, just by talking about it very openly, I think it did shine through and I liked it. Now, this all happened at a time, I mean, keep in mind, we're talking about a two to three year lead time here on, um, on, on getting that capacity installed. So, you know, if you're forecasting demand, it's not always easy then to get it perfectly right. Uh, this also happened at a time when we were internally doing a lot of drives here to get our CapEx percentage down. And yeah, things happen, okay? We corrected it quickly, it's corrected now. We grabbed the opportunity and I'm bullish about that part. But look, there will be other things going wrong. To me, it's more about success in business is getting up one more time, dusting off your gloves, and you march forward. Just maybe to add uh, something to this, uh, to this question. Even if you saw in my presentation that we reduce the uh, amount of capex as a percentage of sales, there is no such objective. 
So we are driving the capex whenever, and we're accepting any capex project whenever it drives growth and returns. So maybe one year we can spend more than four, maybe one year we'll spend less than four. So there is no single objective of a percentage of, uh, of sales for CapEx. Once again, it is driven by sales as a co growth contribution and returns. John? Hi, John Ennis from Goldman. Uh, I have a question on private label. A lot of the presentations have, have sort of focused around the premiumization opportunity. And I wanted to get your view on the threat of private label as you ex essentially extend the price umbrella on the high side. Do you think that creates a greater opportunity for private label to come in and fill the void? Um, and then just a, a clarification question on the mid-single digit growth target. I, I think you said that it includes the businesses already up for review, but does it also include any assumptions on further portfolio rationalization before 2020? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So look, on the, the private label and premiumization, the circumstances are always slightly different depending on what specific category and situation you're talking about. But by and large, I think premiumization is a winning strategy. It does wonders for our top line and also for our bottom line. And I think it also fulfills an important function for our consumers. But premiumization needs to be built on tangible product advantage. And if you're just premiumizing without that, then you know, you're talking in simple and straightforward price hikes. And yes, uh, those at some point will create an umbrella for some people to come in underneath, whether it's private label or whether it's some other brand that basically takes advantage of that uh, more competitive offering and then tries to grab market share from you. So I think premiumization is wonderful, but one of the reasons why all day long, and in particular this morning between Patrice and Stefan, we were stressing this whole notion of product innovation and product development so much is at the end of the day, there needs to be tangible product performance advantage. And based on that, then you can build brands, you can keep, you can keep brands interesting, and you can do exciting things on pricing. Uh, without that, it all comes to naught. So that's why the two are kind of related. Um, and then secondly, on uh, the OG target for 2020, yes, I mean, we'll take account uh, basically at the end of 2020 and whatever gets consolidated or deconsolidated until then, all of that is counted towards then that OG target for 2020. Jo Jonathan. Uh, Mark, you talked about the success that the EMEA region had had when in dealing with legacy issues as well as going for growth. Could I ask at your level, at the group level, what are the legacy issues that you're still grappling with? Yeah, and I wasn't only talking about the success. Uh, I was also just simply admiring the discipline that Marco and the Zone and Mena leadership team are displaying in, in, in basically handling those. Uh, because as you know, this is ongoing work and uh, this will take several years to basically take us uh, through this period. And uh, look, uh, for the group, um, I feel very good about the progress we've made. And uh, obviously, as the world around us, as the market around us keep changing, keeps changing, we'll need to adjust. Uh, but um, frankly, I, I feel there's a lot of built-in strength in what Nestle has to offer. And, uh, and I think we're in the process of making the most of that. Selina. Yeah. Yes, um, I have a few questions on uh, cash return or capital deployment. Um, so if I look into 2020 uh, with the proceeds from some of the disposal, the continued cash generation, uh, net debt to EBDA will fall below one times. Um, is it uh, something that you would be uh, comfortable with? Uh, and if not, at which point there would be a decision about further either share buyback or whether you were holding on for m and And then I have a follow-up on m and um, There's been a, you said I think two-thirds of your capex is in high growth category. Uh, but if you look at m and we have had as well a lot of discussion about growth in food. Uh, so would there be as well uh, uh, pot potential for you to look at uh, or to focus your M&A outside of the top uh, four uh, high growth category? Um, and then finally, should we assume that uh, is going to be small to mid-sized deals or could there be a potential for bigger acquisition? Um, so on the first one, I, I don't want to front run 
the outcome of our reviews on Skin Health and Herda. But uh, if we do have significant cash inflows, it is also understood that within a reasonable time, in addition to telling you what the cash inflow is, we would need to tell you what we're going to be doing uh, with that cash, uh, which is either you know to find a meaningful way to deploy it or to find some meaningful way here to, uh, uh, to return it over time. Uh, it was certainly not the purpose of this exercise, on the one hand, to lever up slightly, only to lever down then with cash inflows coming in. Okay, so um, I think give us some time here, complete the reviews, uh, see what the, uh, what the outcome is, and then with any cash, I think within a reasonable time frame and uh, allowing us some time here for internal discussion, we would certainly also give you some indication what we intend to do with any cash that comes in. Um, on uh, food in particular, and um, also acquisition opportunities outside of the top four, I'm absolutely in favor for reasonable, good, meaningful acquisition opportunities, and I think we confirmed that many, many times. It's all about the right things, and it's about being selective, and it's about being sure what we're buying there, and um, is this something that is only available in a short time frame through acquisition, or is it something we can do on our own? And, um, but, so we have to be selective, and um, I like very much what Francois was pointing out. Uh, you know, we've screened so many deals, and um, in addition to what he said, which is the financial discipline that we exercised on quite a few of these potential deal opportunities, I also wanted to stress and underline the strategic um, discipline that we exercised. Um, I mean, you've seen so many rumors floating around about potential transactions we would have been involved in, but you've, you've seen us also deploy the capital in a very disciplined manner along the lines of categories that really are a hand-in-glove uh, fit uh, to our business. You, don't ha you have not seen us do you know, left-field kind of moves here recently, and, uh, and I think that is something that we're proud of, and we intend to continue that. But yes, we will not limit acquisition ac activity to the top four only, and in fact, even for the last two years, there are already quite a few examples here. T think about Sweet Earth in the U.S., uh, which is part of the food category, an acquisition we're very proud of. Tom. Yeah. Hi. Um, looking at the photograph from the coffee presentation of, of the products that are coming out through Yin Lu, that um, I think the mention was it was the... Uh, uh, number one RTD seller in the category. I'm curious as to the steps that you've taken to, to claw back from the early disappointment of both Yin Lu and Sufushi and to create the powerhouse that you're creating. How much has it to do with partnership with others and how much maybe with the use of e-commerce and new channels that you have at your disposal? But it's been a remarkable turnaround at least uh, thus far. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And look, I mean, we also, we're not trying to look back with rose-colored spectacles here, okay? We didn't buy Yin Lu to be a leading player in, in RTD coffee, okay? We've been truly surprised about how quickly that uh, peanut milk category has been coming down. And uh, I mean, we've, that has given us quite some pain in 2015 and 16. But then, you know, what are you going to do about it? Okay, and uh, it is true, and we did have long-standing ambitious plans on scaling up in ready-to-drink coffee, which I think is a huge, huge, huge opportunity in Asia. Yep. And, um, and uh, this kind of aseptic filling is a key technology to make that happen, and so here was a good way to kind of uh, use that installed infrastructure and, uh, and make good use of it, and over time then, uh, return to growth, and uh, so I think under the circumstances, we made the best out of a situation that has given us a lot more scale in a very important uh, emerging market, but yeah, on a trend or on a category that came under pressure faster than we expected. So this is about a pragmatic response to a situation that, uh, uh, that no one had foreseen at the time, of course, when we bought the business. James? Yep. Hi there. Um, two questions. Firstly, just on the um, the transactions that you've vetted over the last couple of years, the 35 billion, was that, were those just acquisitions or do they include meaningful potential disposals? Um, <clears throat> and then secondly, just on looking at your digital investments, if you look at um, um, your, your first party consumer data, uh, in-house digital capabilities, me digital media spend generally, do you now feel you're ahead of peers here? relative to your size or still got some catch up to do? 
Why did under, you under the first 35, one? it's only on acquisitions. So especially so that it's anyway, we are in a seller's market, so to dispose of any business today is not too much of an issue. So 35 is, was only on acquisition. So think of all the money we could have tossed around and then we didn't, okay? So I uh, hope that gives you some relief. Um, look, on digital, um, I feel very good about where we are. And uh, I mean, obviously, by category, by market, you can always kind of um, uh, come to different conclusions here. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes a little behind and have areas of improvement, but overall, across the board, uh, I really applaud the team and the Patricia's leadership about, you know, how much progress we have made here and, uh, and how much more digitally inspired we are in our uh, marketing efforts. Pierre. Yeah, I, Pierre, Pierre from the, uh, just a follow up question on personalization. Um, um, the question is, is, do you think that with all the progress Nestle has done in terms of velocity, innovation, agility, do you think that, that the organization globally is ready to, to embrace uh, more quickly the personalization? Because I suppose that um, th there are many consequences in terms of supply chain, manufacturing, way of doing business. Uh, is it is it something you you are able to put in place on the short medium term or have we to wait for more years before this kind of uh, of switch? Yeah, look, um, I think as we talk about personalization and especially across all these different categories where this may apply and also different markets uh, where we would want to offer this, uh, don't think of it as one monolithic effort that kind of gets rolled out, okay? I mean, we're too large an organization for this, and it, that would not really respect the kind of decentralized nature of who we are in different circumstances and different markets. So we have already several efforts underway. So for example, uh, Nestle Japan has been doing some very pioneering work uh, on this uh, in the healthy aging category. With Tails.com, we have a majority stake in a business in Europe that I think in the pet space is, is doing fabulous work. Um, then we have um, some very interesting work going on, as we mentioned, in Nestle Health Science and uh, in the nutrition space. But you know, this is different efforts, and, um, and there are different stages, and uh, also different degrees as to how granular you do the personalization. Over time, we'll be sure that we avoid unnecessary, unnecessary duplication We'll also be sure that to the largest extent possible that we try a harmonized data model so that let's say 10, 15 years from now, we're not sitting on totally incompatible pools of data from different parts of the world and different uh, countries and different categories. Um, but again, this will be a multi-pronged effort and, uh, and, and coming from different parts of the organization. And yes, yeah, some of this will, will involve, for example, manufacturing and supply chain upgrades, but this is not one massive investment program and not something that, uh, you know, when you look at these discrete steps, that will all of a sudden lead to a step change here in CapEx. You know, this is something that's, get, that's getting phased in and will be part of our normal CapEx spend over time. So, um, so if you have any concerns about the upfront spending here, um, I think we can alleviate that. Uh, any other questions? Please go ahead. It's uh, Guillaume Delmas from Bank of America. Two questions for me. The first one, Francois, in your presentation, you said that where you land in 2020 against your 17 and a half to 18 and a half margin target will be in part uh, influenced by the need for reinvestment in your business. So my question in this is, how should we interpret this? Are you alluding to potential situations of underinvestment or increased cost of doing business in some of your sales? Or as you might come across some additional opportunities, you want to maintain some PL flexibility in order to accelerate the growth. And then my second question is on uh, pricing. How should we think about um, pricing in your OG algorithm? Um, because as um, Marco said this morning, should we look at premiumization as being the new pricing uh, for most categories and regions? Or is the lack of pricing in recent year more a function of lack of commodity cost inflation and relative FX stability? Thank you. So for the first part of your question, the answer is a second option, so which is more about uh, opportunities to reinvest uh, behind innovation. So this is not linked to the fact that we would underinvest. I think that clearly we, 
invest at the right level. Uh, I think uh, Patrice mentioned it this morning. We have increased the absolute amount of spending last year by about, uh, in marketing by about 1.2%. Uh, this uh, clearly for marketing and R&D, this is, I would say, less about spending more. It's about spending better, which is what has been done, which is about reaching efficiencies. Uh, without uh, necessarily cutting the, uh, the amount of spending. As far as pricing is concerned, I think Marco said it very well this morning, mix is a new form of pricing, but I mean, pricing exists still. I mean, if you look at uh, the situation in Q1, we had 1.2% uh, pricing component in our OG. This is much more than last year. Last year, we were actually at 0.5%, which was made of 0.3 in H1 and 0.9 in, uh, in H2. Pricing, we had moderate pricing over the last couple of years. It was largely the consequence of two factors. The fact that we were living worldwide predominantly in a deflationary environment in Japan, to a certain extent in the US and certainly in Western Europe and especially in our categories. And this was uh, jointly, it came with, uh, with the fact that commodity, the commodity cycle was down. If you look at it two years ago, we were on average, as far as our basket of commodities is concerned, about 30% in 2016, 30% lower than where we were in 2011. So obviously there was le less need for pricing. So part of the pricing that we get this, uh, this year is partly coming from the fact that there is a little bit of uh, increase in, in our basket of commodities. It has to be looked uh, with a lot of care though. You have seen it last year. The basket of commodities can be very different from one zone to the other. So for example, last year, we had a significant increase in, uh, in AMS, while we had a decrease of commodities in the other regions. So this year, I think that uh, it's a little bit different as well. It's largely coming from the mix of uh, categories. For example, Emena has a stronger uh, component of coffee in their total business, like uh, Marco presented this morning. So obviously, as coffee goes down, the pressure as far as commodities is lesser for them. Oh, Pinara. Thanks, Pinar Argo and UBS. I have three quick questions. The first one's on M&A. Uh, some of your competitors are focusing on doing a large number of small deals, so any thoughts on that would be appreciated. The second one is on confectionery. How, does, how do you see confectionery contributing to your future plans on nutrition, health, and wellness, especially when it comes to your local brands rather than the global ones? And then the third one is on waters. Do you see any risk that consumer backlash against plastics may actually negatively impact your bullish views about the category growth in the future? Thank you. Thanks. So um, on the first one, a very consistent uh, message to what we were trying to tell you uh, in London in 2017, and that is we will occasionally invest in smaller mid-sized companies but uh, we're being very, very selective about this. And each and every time, there's uh, a lot of internal questioning about what this new uh, entity will bring to the table that we could not do on our own. Um, you know, when it comes to either a specific brand name, a technology, or something that we could not easily replicate within a reasonable period of time. And the reason that we have to be selective on this, in my opinion, is simply that, um, if you go for a very large number of transactions in this space, and given that you have to give all of these entrepreneurial entities some degree of freedom, you will sooner or later end up basically as an investment fund in small to mid-sized food and beverage companies. And this is not a space where we want to be. And so handling each and every one of these investments takes a lot of extra management time and attention. These are fragile uh, relationships that need to be managed in a very flexible manner. And, um, and so you can do this on a number of deals, but you can't do it 20, 30, 40 times. And, uh, and uh, hence, um, we've been doing some of these deals, as you know, but uh, we continue to be very, very selective on this. And that point of view has not changed over the past uh, several years. The ones we've done until now, I think, uh, have worked out uh, quite well for us. Um, the second question, could you help me again? What was that again? Confectionery. How does confectionery fit confectionary, with your yes, uh, okay. health and wellness? So um, we are quite bullish about some of the progress we have seen in confectionery. Uh, as you recall, when we put the US confectionery business under review, uh, we underlined very strongly our commitment to confectionery on a global scale. But since KitKat is really our, on, our only global brand here, 
We also made it clear that we retain that complete flexibility when it comes to reviewing some of these local brands. Uh, so pulling out of one of them or several of them, as we did with U.S. confectionery, should not be seen as a lack of commitment to the category overall. The category overall, I think, both in terms of nutrition, health, and wellness, when you think about healthy snacking, but also in terms of premiumization, when it comes to just going to higher quality uh, and, and higher priced confectionery, I think it offers a whole lot of opportunity, especially connected to gifting, where you know premiumization uh, is, is, is a very good strategy. And uh, there's also personalization opportunity. And um, so um, I think there's a lot of promise here, and we have a lot of very strong rich local brands with rich local history and lots of local relevance. And this is where I think Patricia's statement comes in. It's not about global or local. It's about, you know, how strong does, how strongly does something resonate, um, you know, in this particular catchment area with our consumers and where can you take this? And so we will, you know, be very selective here. And on some of these we'll invest a lot and others will do less. On others, we may even get out of them, but um, overall, confectionery is a business that we're very interested in. And then you had a question on water and plastics, right? Water and plastic, uh, look, um, I do think uh, we do have several uh, quite interesting container strategies in place that Maurizio described to you. We also then have um, those very interesting dispensing technologies in development that will hit the market very, very shortly. We're talking about basically a year's time. And um, so I think to the extent that um, you can redirect the business in a short period of time to put that new environment into consideration, I, th I think we're, we're doing all of this. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone at scale being significantly ahead of us. And, um, and you know, consumers need hydration. And uh, so I, again, um, is the awareness of this plastics issue going to be on the rise? Yes, absolutely. But I see us in a good space when it comes to addressing uh, you know, these challenges and coming up with solutions that actually meet consumers' expectations. Well, we have a few, a few more minutes. Any more questions? Tom, and then maybe Alain afterwards. Two, two quick questions. Um, one for Francois, which is you referred in your comments that ROIC is going to be increasingly woven into near-term and long-term compensation. I'm curious to hear how that's working. And then, and then for Mark, um, so many people with whom we've met the last couple of days talk about their product launches as version 1.0, 2.0, followed by 3.0. And I'm just curious how that thinking has made its way through the organization and, and what, what do you uh, drive through that uh, thought process? I think for the ROIC, I think it made a lot of sense that we introduced it in the long-term uh, incentive as well as in the short-term, but it's, uh, the uh, share of it is much larger in the long-term incentive, given that you remember that our return on invested capital went uh, down quite significantly uh, in, uh, for some time. So I think but it requires some understanding as well. So this is a KPI which, in my opinion, is very well suited for the top management because you need to understand what the various components, it's a relatively complex KPI because of the numerator, denominator, and one large part is linked to M&A, which, uh, as you know, most of these decisions are made at executive level. So whatever, but uh, I mean, at operating level, for example, in, uh, in some of our markets, we are much more focused on some of its components, like working capital, like CapEx. I think it makes sense as well to make sure that people are incentivized on what they can influence directly. And ROIC, uh, from, uh, as a consequence, is more relevant at executive level. Tom, on the second question, look, you can always do better, but I think um, that new thinking has gotten very good traction inside the organization. And don't just take my words for it, I think you're also seeing already in the market now enough examples from Nestle where in a short order of time we are coming out with version 2.0 and then believe us, there's going to be a 3.0 and a 4.0 and a 5.0, so it's happening. Um, one thing that was mentioned this morning that I just wanted to underline, all of this also gets facilitated and supported by this internal idea to launch process that was radically simplified and, uh, and, uh, and made much more flexible. Because as you can imagine, for an organization here that launches literally thousands of products every year, if you don't do this without some consistency when it comes to the internal process, you're all over the place. And, um, and hence, uh, you know, it was important here, but we wanted to lighten that process, that we still need a process. And, um, and um, I think significant work has been done 
um, uh, to that regard. That process was rolled out last year, and I think it's facilitating that whole approach. And it doesn't put you into this perfectionism straitjacket where if you follow all the discrete pro project steps of the past, it takes you literally one or two or three years to get something out the door. And now we have something that's much more attuned to the specific circumstance, and hence it kind of facilitates this rapid fire uh, innovation kind of thinking. Uh, uh, Alain? Thank you very much. Alain Oberhuber, main first. Mark, I have a question regarding the JVs. We heard that uh, you feel very well with uh, Froneri, but how do you feel with the other JV serial partners worldwide as well as with Lactalis? Um, look, so Froneri, I think, is a bit of a different animal in that uh, this is a joint venture with a private equity, equity partner. Um, and uh, typically, as you know, given the time horizon of a private equity partner, these things are not forever. And so the whole joint venture is really designed on having a significant amount of impact within a short order of time. And I think they've done beautifully in that regard and really uh, energized and rejuvenated that, uh, that ice cream business. Um, as you know, CPW is a 30-year partnership. And uh, so that one, when it, was con when it was concluded, when it was started, it was done without a specific time horizon in mind. And, um, um, I think over the years, it's been a very strong partnership for us, but we are also pretty open by the fact that when you look at the cereal business around the world, we have missed out on some premiumization and nutrition, health and wellness opportunities uh, and, and keeping that category as relevant as it could have been. And that's something that uh, both partners are very much focusing on uh, right now. And then Lactalis, again, is, is a different type of joint venture to the extent that it's not a 50-50. And so Lactalis is in the lead here. And uh, we have contributed some of our brand names. And uh, you know there's some continued stewardship here. But it's clearly Lactalis that is uh, in the lead when it comes to that partnership. Alina, yeah. Hi, two questions from me. So the first one is, um, can you talk maybe a bit more about the opportunities that you see in plant-based? Uh, we've heard a lot about it today, but I wonder if you could possibly put some numbers on it. So, you know, in three to five years' time, how big could this business be for you? Um, what areas in plant-based are you most interested in? Is it just meat alternatives? Is it dairy as well? Could we see you go into beverages? And maybe also talk a bit about the sustainability, sustainability or maybe sourcing risk around that. For example, if you start doing almond milk, for example, is that possibly a, a, you know, a challenge? Um, so that's the first question. And actually, sorry, just on that as well, is private label specifically a threat? Because it seems like a lot of the retailers are launching their own um, vegan ranges, so at least in, in the retail channel. So the, that's the first question. And then secondly, um, in terms of marketing as a percentage of sales, uh, as you're pursuing these in efficiencies, so improvement in ROI, um, how should we think about that progressing over time? Um, should we see that continue to grow? And what's the mix between traditional and digital as part of that? Um, maybe to start with the second question, it's important to me, especially in light of some of the numbers that uh, Patrice outlined this morning, uh, I don't look at that marketing budget as a source of savings, okay? And I think it's a short-lived strategy if you do. And so I love the efficiencies we're generating by you know, being more pointed, more targeted, and what have you. But for God's sake, let's reinvest them and do more with that and really you know, develop our business and, uh, and, and go for future growth. And um, um, now, is it always going to even out dollar for dollar? No. And so maybe some of that um, will also lead to net savings. But as we're approaching this, we're not approaching it with the goal of generating savings, just like we don't do it on R&D. Um, so really, for there, it's more about the outcome and more th about the things we can do with the spending uh, that, we're, we're, uh, that, that we put in place. Um, on plant-based, I don't have sort of a global number for you. Um, uh, I would like to confirm that it, of course, includes uh, the meat alternatives and also the dairy alternatives, since you know, we have lots of categories that touch both of those. And to me, it's not only about being in the basic article. So I think in dairy, it's even easier to understand. It's not about you know, offering the almond milk. It's more about you know, then having those plant-based components uh, be in some of the higher value products that we offer, like for example, our coffee creamers or our premium ice cream. 
And I think that's also your best way to protect against that commoditization because I think in some of these very basic plant-based ingredients, just like you know the milk alternatives or so, you will see some commoditization. And so uh, what's more important is to have those plant-based ingredients then in higher value products that give the customer some additional uh, um, uh, added value, um, you know, either a finished product or something that has convenience to it or what have you. Um, and, and usually also premium offerings uh, and with better nutritional values. And that's the direction we're going. Alan, Alan. go ahead. So I wonder if you could just um, speak a little bit to the, the performance of the, the coffee business in, uh, in Europe. Um, I think at the, at the Q1, I think you alluded to the fact that maybe one of your competitors had um, decided to, to pass on the lower coffee price to, to grab some market share. But I think Marco also said in his presentation that you were rapidly winning back market share. So maybe if you could just give a little bit more color on what, what played out there and, and, and where we are in that particular competitive battle. Thank you. Um, and look, um, as always with these things that are unfolding, there's a limit as to how much detail we can get into. But uh, let me also put it in a wider context. These things will always happen, okay? Crove category or no, you will always have, you know, the competitive back and forth uh, in, in, in these categories. And so some quarters will turn out better and some turn out worse. Uh, what's more important here is that when you look at the Q1 reporting and how we talked about it and how Marco talked about it, uh, you know, first of all, full transparency and openness about here is the situation and no sugar coating. And then, yes, inside, you know, uh, we are very, very focused on what we have to do about it. And, uh, and Marco is leading that charge. And that includes, of course, the normal short term competitive interaction, but then also longer term, you know, if you want to be sure that you get away with um, a better pricing, you have to have the differentiated and premiumized products that really justify that. And, uh, and it's important to work on both of these angles, you know, short term, the hand to hand combat about making sure that we come out of this okay, but then mid to longer term also, you know, what's the flow of new and improved products uh, that really makes sure that uh, we get away with very attractive uh, pricing and premiumization. Any other questions? Well, it seems that uh, there are no more questions. I leave it to Mark. That's the case. Uh, let me really thank you for uh, your patience and perseverance during the day. I know it's been a lot of data we've been throwing at you, quite a few PowerPoint slides and, uh, and uh, questions we answered. Um, also, to everyone out on the web, uh, thanks for staying with us and uh, following us through that day. I can tell you here on behalf of Team Nestle that we've been looking forward to this day for quite a long time because uh, we were eager to tell you about the progress we've been making and also share that excitement about where we'll take the business going forward, and I hope some of, some of that came across. So thank you, and uh, would also again like to thank uh, the NUSA team and uh, Steve here for setting all of this up, including then the store visits tomorrow, and also, Luca, thanks to you and your investor relations team for uh, setting up the day and organizing all of this, and we really appreciate it. And uh, I think it was uh, th that day, you know, when it comes to just sharing the fundamentals of the business and where the business is going uh, was quite a success. So thanks a lot. Uh, we look forward to seeing those people who are in the room with us for dinner tonight and the store visits tomorrow. And uh, stay in touch with us, follow us, and uh, I can tell you it's going to be an interesting journey that we're in together. Thanks.